Today, we're going to cover some of the caving and cave diving disasters that we have covered on this channel. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this. In the depths of Little Dismal Sink, three seasoned divers set out on a daring mission to explore and map the unknown. Their goal, to uncover hidden passages beneath the Earth's surface. But what started as an ambitious adventure quickly turned into a harrowing fight for survival. One diver met a mysterious and tragic fate that will leave you on the edge of your seat. In this video, we'll uncover the chilling details of what happened to one of the three brave explorers. Before we dive into today's video, make sure to hit the bell icon so you don't miss any updates. We upload daily. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and join our amazing community. Now, let's get started. The Leon Sinks Geological Area is found in southern and southwestern Leon County, Florida, USA. It is located on the Woodville Karst Plain, a region known for its unique geological features. This area has a mature karst system, which means it has many sinkholes, caves, and underground rivers. These features are part of the Upper Floridan Aquifer, an important source of water. The Leon Sinks area has one of the largest underwater cave systems in the world. These caves connect to Wakula Springs, a large natural spring nearby. Because the rocks in this area are very permeable, meaning water can easily pass through them, the aquifer is very vulnerable to pollution. Anything harmful that gets into the ground can quickly spread through the water system. To protect and understand this delicate system, a group called the Woodville Karst Plain Project has done a lot of mapping and exploration of the caves. They are studying how water moves through the area and how to keep the water clean. This work is important because the water in these caves is a crucial resource for the local environment and people. The Leon Sinks are home to many forms of life. For example, you can find freshwater eels and rare types of crustaceans, which are small, shrimp-like creatures. Some of these crustaceans are unique to this area, like the Woodville Karst Plain Crayfish and the Swimming Florida Cave Isopod, known scientifically as Remicellus parvus. These creatures only live in the Woodville Karst Plain, making the area very special and important for biodiversity. Wakula Cave is a large, underwater cave system made up of many branching tunnels. So far, 19 kilometers of these tunnels have been surveyed and mapped. The tunnels are like long tubes with a consistent width and depth, usually about 300 feet deep. Sometimes, these tubes are separated by larger chambers of different shapes and sizes. The biggest tunnel goes south from the entrance of the spring and cave for more than 6.1 kilometers. There are also four smaller tunnels, including the one leading to Leon Sinks, which connect to this main tunnel. Most of these smaller tunnels have been fully explored. On December 15, 2007, members of the Woodville Karst Plain Project discovered a connection between the Wakula Cave System and the Leon Sinks Cave System. This connection created the Wakula Leon Sinks Cave System. With this connection, it became the longest underwater cave in the United States and the sixth largest in the world, with a total of 51.48 kilometers of mapped passages. Many of the sinkholes in the Leon Sinks geological area are linked through underwater caves. In May 1988, a group of divers were mapping the Little Dismal Sink in Leon County, Florida. This group included three separate teams that were all in the cave at the same time. The divers that day were some of the best and most respected divers of the time, like Parker Turner, Bill Gavin, Bill Main, and others. Their main goal was to collect geological data and survey data for the last part of the upstream and downstream tunnels of the deep section. The deep section is the deepest part of the cave, as its name suggests. To get to this deep section, a diver must enter the sink and navigate through several very narrow passages. First, a diver enters the peanut room, which is the first room in the cave. After the peanut room, they move on to the second room. Once they pass the second room, the divers can reach the fourth room by going through either the third room or a narrow shortcut that connects the second room directly to the fourth room. Finally, the fifth room is where the upper passage ends. The divers had to be very careful while navigating these rooms because the passages between them were extremely tight and challenging. The work they were doing was important because it helped to create detailed maps and gather valuable information about the cave's structure. This data was crucial for understanding the cave better and ensuring the safety of future explorations. At that time, the upper part of the cave, where the first few rooms are located, was well explored. The first part of the cave was about 700 feet long and went down to a depth of 150 feet at its deepest point. In the fifth room, called the well, there was a hole in the floor. This hole led to a nearly straight down shaft. The divers would go down this shaft to reach a depth of 170 feet. This brought them into the sixth room, which is part of the deeper section of the cave. The deep section has three main parts. 
the sixth room, the deep upstream tunnel, and the deep downstream tunnel. The deep upstream tunnel goes down to a depth of 220 feet. This was the depth the divers aimed to reach and work at during this particular dive. This part of the cave was important to explore because it helped the divers understand more about the cave's structure and gather crucial data for future dives. Diving to a depth of 220 feet for long periods requires special training and certifications in technical diving. Divers need a strong understanding of decompression diving and must use specialized equipment. One important piece of equipment for deep dives is a dry suit. A dry suit is a waterproof suit that keeps a layer of air inside to protect the diver from cold water at deep depths. As a diver goes deeper, the water pressure increases, which squeezes the dry suit and the air pocket inside it. To prevent the suit from becoming too tight, the diver needs to add more air from their cylinders as they go deeper. When a diver is at their deepest point, their dry suit has the most air in it. However, this creates a challenge when they start to ascend. As the diver goes up, the pressure outside the suit decreases, causing the air inside the suit to expand. This expansion increases the diver's buoyancy, which means they could start to float up too quickly. To avoid this, the diver must release some air through a vent valve on the suit. The dry suit helps the diver control their buoyancy. It's very important for the diver to know how much air is in their suit and how it affects their buoyancy as they ascend. Losing control of their buoyancy, especially while cave diving, can be very dangerous and could lead to a life or death situation. On May 15, 1988, the divers put on their gear and entered the Little Dismal Sink. As they entered the first room, they followed their plan and separated into different teams. Parker Turner and Shirley Bailey stayed in the first room. Their task was to collect rock samples from this area. Meanwhile, Bill McFadden, Bill Main, and Bill Gavin moved deeper into the cave. They first went to the fifth room. From there, they went through the vertical shaft that led to the sixth room and the lower section of the cave. This is the point where they split up to continue their tasks in different parts of the cave. Bill Gavin was very experienced and knowledgeable. He decided to go into the downstream tunnel alone. He was famous for his deep diving skill and expertise. Bill Gavin worked as a U.S. naval engineer and had lots of experience with both deep sea and cave diving. He created a special device called the Gavin Scooter. This device helps divers travel further and move better underwater. This scooter, with changes and improvements over time, allowed cave divers to cover greater distances and move more easily underwater. William Hogarth M., also known as Bill Main, was another pioneer in cave diving. He developed the Hogarthian gear configuration, which is used in the Do It Right, DIR approach to scuba diving. This method became very popular and well known. Both Maine and Bill Gavin, as well as other divers from the Woodville Karst Plain Project, WKPP, used this method to explore and map cave systems. The WKPP's mission was to map underwater caves from Tallahassee, Florida, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. This included famous places like Wakula Springs and Leon Sinks, the largest underwater cave system in the United States. Maine and Gavin were extremely experienced divers. They were well prepared for the challenging task of exploring and mapping these complex underwater cave systems. The Hogarthian method that Maine developed helped make their dives safer and more efficient. The third diver in the group was Bill McFadden, who was going to survey the deep section of the cave. He was 32 years old only, but had a lot of experience in diving. He lived in Tallahassee and had done 40 dives in Dismal Springs, including 15 deep dives. McFadden was also well known for his skills in cave mapping. He had a special talent for creating accurate maps based on his mental image of the inside of a cave. His ability to transform what he saw in his mind into detailed maps was highly regarded. Gavin, Maine, and McFadden were chosen for this dive because of their skills and experience. Gavin and Maine had many years of diving experience, and McFadden knew the local area well and was great at making maps. Together, their combined talents made the team confident that their dive to survey the deep section would be successful. Bill Gavin left the sixth room and went into the downstream tunnel to survey that area by himself. Bill Main and Bill McFadden started into the upstream tunnel. Main led the way, slowly moving forward through the tunnel. He tied the guideline as he went, while McFadden followed behind. McFadden stayed close to the line, using a compass to keep his direction and making notes on his survey slate. He was trying to navigate the tunnel, handle his compass, and take notes at the same time. This made things tricky, and his equipment got tangled with the line twice. First, McFadden's battery got caught in the line. He couldn't untangle it by himself. 
so Maine had to come back and help him release the battery from the line. Next, McFadden's safety reel got tangled. This problem was fixed quickly, but both incidents slowed their progress. The condition of the tunnel also made it hard to move fast. The tunnel was narrow and difficult to navigate, which made their progress even slower. The upstream tunnel had a low ceiling in some places, only about three feet high, and the floor was covered with a lot of silt. This was not ideal for surveying because if the divers disturbed the silt, it could reduce visibility to zero, making it impossible to see or do their work. So they had to move very slowly and be extremely careful not to kick up the silt. Even though the conditions were difficult, Bill Main and Bill McFadden managed to successfully map a large area of the upstream tunnel. They worked carefully to avoid disturbing the silt, which allowed them to see what they were doing and take accurate notes. Eventually, their gas supply started to get low, and Maine signaled that it was time to go back. Overall, even though they had to move slowly, the dive was a success. They gathered a lot of useful information and mapped a significant part of the tunnel. On the way back from their survey in the upstream tunnel, Bill Maine led the way using the guideline he had set earlier. Bill McFadden followed behind, making sure to avoid disturbing the silt, which could be dangerous if it obscured their vision or caused them to lose the guideline. Throughout their way back, they remained careful about not kicking up silt. Losing sight of the guideline could lead to serious problems, so they moved slowly and carefully. At times, McFadden stopped to update his notes and survey the surroundings. Maine waited patiently until McFadden was ready to continue, ensuring they stayed together. As they approach the sixth room, they start moving fast. Occasionally, despite their efforts, they accidentally kick up some silt. When this happened, Maine stopped and looked back to ensure McFadden was Nevi. When the water was clear, they could see the guideline clearly, which Maine had attached earlier. This guideline served as their lifeline, leading them directly back to the sixth room. After kicking up silt a few times, the water became very murky and visibility became very low in parts of the tunnel. This happened before they reached the exit, so they couldn't see anything. Maine went through the murky water and reached the clear, dark water of the sixth room. He waited there for McFadden, but he didn't show up. However, as time passed, Maine grew concerned. He realized that McFadden should have already exited the tunnel. Maine decided to swim back into the tunnel to look for him. Just then, he noticed a light coming from behind him. It was Bill Gavin, who had finished surveying the downstream tunnel and was heading towards the exit shaft in the sixth room. Maine quickly swam to Gavin and told him that McFadden was still in the upstream tunnel and was supposed to have come out already. They needed to act quickly to find McFadden and make sure he was safe. Immediately, Gavin swam into the upstream tunnel. As he entered, he encountered the area where the silt had been kicked up, causing the water to be pitch black with zero visibility. He relied on the guideline to guide him, but also used his hands to feel around as much as possible. Suddenly, the silt cleared, and Gavin found himself in an area with much better visibility. There, he discovered McFadden. McFadden was off from the guideline, but was unharmed. Gavin quickly reached out to McFadden and guided him back to the guideline. Together, Gavin and McFadden swam back along the guideline towards the sixth room where Maine was waiting just outside the tunnel. When they arrived, everyone took a moment to catch their breath and ensure that everyone was all right. Thankfully, McFadden was safe. However, their air supply was running low. They had used up valuable time searching for McFadden. It was crucial for them to return as quickly as possible. They knew they were running out of time and needed to make every second count. At this point, they realized they were going to be very close to using up all their air. They made their way towards the shaft leading to the bottom of the fifth room, known as the well. There, Gavin attached himself to the dive propulsion vehicle, DPV. Without it, their chances of getting out of the cave were very low. Hooking up to the DPV was crucial for their escape plan. As they got ready to leave, McFadden signaled to Gavin that he was out of air. Gavin quickly gave McFadden his long air hose to share his air. Now, both Gavin and McFadden were breathing from Gavin's air supply. Gavin started the DPV, and they began speeding up towards the fifth room. While they were going up, they had to release air from their dry suits to control how high they floated. Moving through the fifth room with the DPV, Gavin and McFadden both depended on Gavin's air because McFadden had used up all of his own. Maine was using his air up fast, even though they were moving quickly with the DPV. As they went up, they were running out of time. Gavin let air out of his dry suit to avoid floating too much, but it didn't help much. McFadden, holding onto Gavin's manifold, lost control of his suit and started to panic. Seeing McFadden struggling, Maine acted quickly. He grabbed McFadden's legs, trying to help stabilize his buoyancy. Despite their efforts, when they finally stopped moving upwards, they found themselves 80 feet higher in the bell ceiling of the fifth room. 
The buoyancy was still off, causing them more trouble. Gavin checked his air gauge and saw it was down to 1,000 PSI. Normally, this would be enough for one person to make it back to the decompression tanks, which were 700 feet away, using the DPV for propulsion. However, with both Gavin and McFadden sharing this air, and McFadden feeling stressed and breathing heavily, Gavin knew they were in serious trouble. They didn't have enough air to safely reach the tanks together. Maine tried to convince McFadden to share air with him instead of holding onto Gavin's manifold, but McFadden was too stressed to let go. They were running out of time, so Gavin started the DPV and sped towards the fourth room, pulling McFadden with him. Maine helped by holding McFadden's legs to move faster. They successfully passed through the fourth room and then the third, all the while using their remaining air carefully. It wasn't an easy journey. McFadden's buoyancy was still unstable and he was feeling stressed. Despite this, they were making decent progress towards the decompression tanks. They opted for a shortcut into the second room and then passed through the duck under from the second room to the first. However, McFadden lost control of his dry suit again, causing them to suddenly ascend from 100 feet to 60 feet. At this critical moment, Maine realized he could use his knife to cut McFadden's suit and release the trapped air, which would reduce his buoyancy. Then, Gavin and Maine could pull McFadden to safety. But this plan had risks. If they managed to execute it, they might save McFadden. However, there was a chance McFadden could panic when he felt the rush of cold water from his suit being cut. This reaction could be fatal for McFadden, and it might endanger Gavin if McFadden didn't release him. So Maine decided not to cut McFadden's suit and keep trying to help McFadden reach the exit. However, he knew that getting everyone through the two upcoming narrow passages would be incredibly difficult. Despite the challenges, they pressed forward, determined to reach the decompression tanks. They navigated through the cave, making their way to the balcony, and then through the low Bing plain just before encountering the first narrow passage. As they approached, Gavin started to notice that his regulator was becoming harder to breathe through. His air was running out. Gavin started thinking fast. He thought about how strange it would be to come so close to reaching the exit only to drown. The situation was intense as they faced this important moment on their way to safety. McFadden started using Maine's long air hose, leaving Gavin with no air at all. Now, both Gavin and McFadden were without any air left, and Maine was the only one with an air supply. Gavin's lungs felt like they were on fire as he realized McFadden was breathing from Maine's hose, and Maine only had one regulator. Maine took charge of the situation calmly. He saw Gavin struggling and quickly gave him the regulator. Gavin took three deep breaths, thinking they might be his last. He felt numb from lack of air, stressed, and couldn't think clearly. He had come so close to the exit, but now felt resigned to death. Suddenly, Gavin felt a release of pressure. McFadden had let go of Maine's hose. Gavin looked over and saw that McFadden was unconscious and drifting away. He realized McFadden had died. Gavin was still not fully aware and felt like he might not make it. Maine pulled Gavin through the narrow passage, sharing the breathing equipment. Gavin slowly started to wake up and think more clearly as they went on. They finally reached the tanks with decompression and oxygen just in time. They began the lengthy process of decompression, knowing their friend Bill McFadden had passed away moments earlier and his body was right below them. An autopsy later found that Bill McFadden had decompression sickness, where nitrogen gas bubbles form in the body's tissues or bloodstream during rapid ascent. This happened multiple times during their dive. These bubbles can travel to the brain, heart, or lungs, causing serious harm and ultimately death. Bill McFadden had extensive diving experience, with a lot dives in Little Dismal, including deep dives. He also explored Cheryl Sink and Sullivan Sink. Despite his skill and experience, this particular dive was very challenging. It's a reminder that even experienced divers can face unexpected dangers in deep waters. No diver truly knows how they'll react in an emergency at great depths until it happens to them. Sadly, this dive ended in tragedy. In the end, the daring mission to map Little Dismal Sink turned into a tragic tale of survival and loss. Despite their experience and bravery, the three divers faced unexpected dangers that led to a heartbreaking outcome. The story of Bill McFadden's tragic death serves as a powerful reminder of the risks and uncertainties that come with exploring the unknown. Imagine stepping into the dark, mysterious depths of Onyx Cave where every twist and turn holds secrets waiting to be uncovered. On a crisp October day, four young adventurers did just that, driven by a thirst for exploration and excitement. But as they ventured deeper into the labyrinth, their lack of experience began to show. What happened next in the shadows of Onyx Cave? 
what went wrong down there. Stay with us as we uncover the mysterious events that took place deep within the cave. Onyx Cave, nestled in the heart of the Coronado National Forest in Arizona, known as one of the finest caves in the state, Onyx Cave is a stunning example of nature's artistry, with its remarkable formations and intricate passageways. This cave is a geological marvel filled with unique features like helictites and beautifully developed speleothems, such as shields, which make it a must-see for anyone interested in cave exploration. Onyx Cave is a solutional cave system formed over millions of years. It boasts about 0.8 kilometer of twisting passages carved out of Permian limestone, which is part of the Santa Rita Mountains. This limestone was originally formed from the remains of tiny sea creatures, deposited layer upon layer over a vast period of time. Eventually, powerful geological forces deformed and cracked the limestone. Water seeped into these cracks and slowly expanded them, creating the stunning onyx cave we see today. The cave's history is rich and intriguing. It was first mentioned in the accounts of pioneer ranchers and miners who arrived in the 1870s and 1880s. However, artifacts found in a small shelter cave next to the main cave indicate that onyx was used long before then by hunters, explorers, and Native Americans. Evidence of the past, like the remains of a mill foundation, can still be seen at the bottom of Onyx Hill. In the 1940s and 1950s, Onyx Cave became a popular spot for adventurous explorers. Unfortunately, this increased popularity led to significant vandalism, with many of the cave's formations being broken and its walls scarred by paint. In response, the entrance was gated in 1962 to help preserve its natural beauty. Sadly, the gate was dynamited shortly after, and the cave suffered further damage until Escobrosa Grotto, Incorporated took control in 1974. Since then, they have managed the cave, carrying out large-scale cleanup and repair projects to restore much of its former glory. Escobrosa Grotto continues to manage Onyx Cave today, ensuring it remains one of the best-preserved caves in southern Arizona. They lease the cave, maintain the gate, and administer access through a strict management plan. Their efforts are focused on protecting Onyx Cave as a non-renewable resource and keeping it in pristine condition for future generations to enjoy. Exploring Onyx Cave is a thrilling experience for those with a passion for caving. The cave is known for its beauty and world-class caving opportunities, featuring dozens of rare shield formations, flowstone, columns, helictites, and soda straws. It's a primarily horizontal cave with several levels, but its unique structure often requires cavers to use vertical techniques and equipment to progress from one level to the next. Onyx Cave stretches over 11,300 feet, offering both challenges and breathtaking sights. However, exploring this cave is not for the inexperienced or unprepared. In the past, a lack of preparation and knowledge led to injuries and even one tragic death from a 95-foot fall. Today, all trips are led by experienced, independent leaders, and participants must have some prior caving experience. On the 4th of October 1968, a group of four young men set out on an adventure. Truman Kellum, 21 years old, led his friends Robert Pfister, Philip Schaff, and Matthew Scoble, all around 20 years old, into the mysterious depths of Onyx Cave. This journey was supposed to be an exciting exploration. The four young men were excited for adventure and thrilled by the idea of exploring the unknown. They were not seasoned cavers, but rather a group of friends looking for excitement in the depths of the earth. Their craving for exploration and discovery led them to the renowned Onyx Cave, located in the Santa Rita Mountains of Arizona. This cave, with its stunning formations and intricate passageways, was a perfect destination for those seeking adventure. The group entered Onyx Cave at about 5.30 p.m., filled with passion and a sense of adventure. They crossed a 15-foot deep chasm known as the Gorge and proceeded to explore the cave. They followed a route called the Loop, which led them to a section of the cave known as the Hell Hole, a daunting 150-foot vertical shaft. It was here that the inexperience of the group began to show. Wall writings indicated that the Hell Hole was 300 feet deep, but Kellum assumed this was an exaggeration and estimated it to be only about 30 feet deep. This critical mistake would soon have dire results. Kellum decided to explore the hellhole further. He and Scobble found a small crawlway that opened into the side of the shaft. Believing it to be only a short drop, Kellum tied knots in the rope every three feet to help him descend and backed over the edge, using the rope for support. Unfortunately, he misjudged the depth and found himself dangling without any footholds just a few feet below the edge. Panic set in as he tried to climb back up, but he lost his grip on the rope and fell 150 feet to the bottom of the hellhole. 
The time was around 8.45 p.m. when the fall occurred. His friends, shocked and terrified, quickly assessed the situation. To their relief, they discovered that Kellum was still alive. Despite his severe injuries, he remained conscious and could speak, although it was clear he was in desperate need of help. Realizing the gravity of the situation, the remaining three members of the group quickly came out of the cave to seek help. They contacted the Santa Cruz County Sheriff, who then reached out to Sergeant Ted Brandis, head of the Pima County Sheriff's Department Volunteer Search and Rescue Team. Brandis, in turn, contacted the Southern Arizona Rescue Association, SARA, a group with experience in cave rescues. The rescue teams, including a non-caver doctor, quickly made their way to Onyx Cave. Their mission was clear, to save Kellum and bring him to safety. They rigged ropes and equipment to navigate both the gorge and the hell hole, ensuring a safe passage for the rescuers. By around 3 a.m., a rescuer had reached Kellum at the bottom of the shaft. At this point, Kellum was still conscious and could communicate, despite his broken arm, broken leg, and severe head injuries. The rescue team worked swiftly to provide medical attention and prepare to lift him out of the cave. However, as the night wore on, Kellum's condition began to deteriorate. Between 6 and 7 a.m., it became clear that Kellum had passed away, likely due to internal injuries sustained from the fall. The rescue operation turned into a recovery mission, and Kellum's body was finally brought out of the cave at about 5 p.m. the day following his fall. The tragedy was a harsh reminder of the dangers of caving without proper experience, preparation, and caution. The story of Truman Kellum and his friends in Onyx Cave is a powerful reminder of the importance of preparation, experience, and caution when exploring the underground world. Their adventure, driven by a thirst for discovery, tragically highlighted how a lack of experience and underestimating nature's challenges can lead to disaster. This incident underscores the need for proper training and safety measures to ensure that exciting explorations do not turn into tragedies. Caving offers incredible experiences and stunning sights, but it also requires respect for the unpredictable environment and careful planning. The brave efforts of the rescue teams, who worked tirelessly to try to save Kellum, serve as a testament to the spirit of teamwork and dedication needed in such dangerous situations. Two brave cavers set out on a daring journey to explore the mysterious depths of Groaning Cave. What started as an exciting adventure quickly turned into a test of survival. As the icy night fell and the shadows inside the cave grew darker, one wrong move changed everything. With no easy way out and the cold creeping in, their fate hung in the balance. What really happened deep inside Groaning Cave that night? The full story will leave you breathless. Groaning Cave, located in the White River National Forest, Colorado, is a fascinating underground labyrinth and the longest cave in the state, stretching over 14.7 miles. Discovered by cavers in 1968, this remarkable cave has been the subject of ongoing exploration and survey work ever since. Although its boundaries were mapped out early on, many additional miles of interior passages have been documented, with hundreds more waiting to be explored. Access to Groaning Cave is carefully controlled to protect both the cave and those who wish to explore it. The United States Forest Service, USFS, and the Colorado Cave Survey work together to manage entry. A permit from the USFS is required, along with liability waivers collected by the Colorado Cave Survey. The cave is secured by a locked gate, and only qualified cavers who have received approval are given the lock combination. This combination is regularly changed to ensure safety and conservation. Groaning Cave offers a unique challenge. Though not technically difficult, it is a cold, high-altitude cave with a complex maze of passages that can be strenuous and potentially dangerous for inexperienced or unprepared cavers. The cave is also adorned with delicate formations which are easily damaged by careless visitors. As a result, the cave is closed for most of the year, from August 15 to April 15th, to protect the resident bat population. This leaves a short window, typically from late May to mid-August, for exploration. The management of Groaning Cave is guided by a memorandum of understanding between the Colorado Cave Survey and the Eagle District Ranger Office of the USFS, while the 2024 management plan encourages recreation and exploration. Its primary goal is the long-term preservation of this unique natural wonder. Cavers planning to visit must prepare carefully. 
keeping in mind the limited access season and the responsibilities that come with exploring such a fragile environment. On April 3, 1970, Don Davis, a 31-year-old experienced caver, and his young companion, 19-year-old Dave Harrison, embarked on what was supposed to be an exciting adventure to explore Groaning Cave, nestled on the rim of Deep Creek Canyon in Colorado. The day started with a sense of anticipation and excitement as they decided, almost on a whim, to venture into the cave. However, this impulsive decision set the stage for an ordeal that would test their endurance and survival skills to the limit. The two cavers had originally planned to reach Groaning Cave through its main entrance. However, since they hadn't secured the key for the gate that would allow easy access, they were considering an alternative route to enter the cave. The bypass chimney, a more challenging and less conventional entrance to the cave, became their only option. This choice, made on the spur of the moment, would soon lead them into an intense and dangerous situation. They left their Jeep at 2.40 p.m. and began the six-mile trek toward the cave. This wasn't a simple hike. The ground was covered in snow, making progress slow and more difficult. Both men were carrying heavy backpacks filled with gear, and they wore snowshoes to navigate the deep snow. As they walked along the snow-covered trail, the cold began to creep in, and the sun started to dip below the horizon. Despite their best efforts, nightfall arrived, and they found themselves still a mile and a half from the cave. Temperatures dropped to a bone-chilling minus three degrees Fahrenheit as they camped on the snow miles from their destination. With only the stars above and the icy ground below, they spent a long, freezing night in the wilderness. Their decision to stay or set up a temporary camp was a testament to their survival instincts. The clear night offered little comfort as they tried to stay warm, huddled in their sleeping bags, knowing that they still had a long way to go. The next day, April 4th, dawned bright and cold. After breaking camp and continuing their journey, they finally reached Groaning Cave at 12.30 p.m. Their joy was clear as they reached the cave's mouth after a tiring hike. Exhausted but determined, they quickly ate a meal to regain their strength before venturing into the cave. Groaning Cave, with its complex network of passages and chambers, had always held a certain allure for cavers. For Davis and Harrison, the idea of exploring a remote and previously uncharted part of the cave was irresistible. The cave's labyrinthine passages twisted and turned in every direction, offering both wonder and challenge to those brave enough to explore them. The cavers pressed on, moving deeper into the cave, where they discovered virgin passages that no one had seen before. It was a thrilling experience, one that only true cavers could fully appreciate. The hours passed quickly as they explored the cave, navigating its narrow passages and marveling at the intricate formations. They lost track of time, caught up in the excitement of their discoveries. By the time they realized it was getting late, it was already 8 p.m., and they knew it was time to head back. After hours of exploration, Davis and Harrison made their way back to the bypass chimney entrance, a narrow, vertical passage that required careful climbing. Davis, already tired from the exhausting hike and the hours spent caving, faced the daunting task of climbing the chimney to reach the exit. He was an experienced caver, but tiredness can dull even the sharpest instincts. As Davis climbed, he misjudged a hold, a small but critical mistake. His foot slipped and he lost his grip. In an instant, he fell about six feet, landing awkwardly. The impact twisted his left arm in an unnatural position, causing immediate intense pain. Davis had dislocated his shoulder, and the pain was so severe that he couldn't move his arm without excruciating agony. Panic began to set in as they realized the gravity of the situation. With a dislocated shoulder, Davis was effectively immobilized, unable to continue the climb. The pain was too much, and any attempt to move his arm only made it worse. Harrison, seeing his companion in such distress, quickly descended to help. But there was little he could do to ease Davis's suffering. Fearing that the injury might be a fracture, they decided not to attempt any further manipulation of the arm. With no other options, Harrison knew he had to act quickly. He brought down food, water, and their sleeping bags to make Davis as comfortable as possible. They were trapped in a remote part of the cave, far from help, and Harrison faced the daunting task of leaving his injured friend behind to seek rescue. It was a gut-wrenching decision, but it was their only hope. As the hours passed away, Davis was left alone in the cold, dark cave, battling both the pain in his shoulder and the fear that help might not arrive in time. The isolation was suffocating, the darkness absolute. He tried to stay warm, wrapping himself in their sleeping bags, and kept his mind occupied by focusing on the rhythm of his breathing. Despite the pain and the cold, Davis didn't slip into shock, a testament to his resilience and survival skills. Meanwhile, Harrison started the hard climb out of the cave, walking on snowshoes, 
carrying the heavy weight of knowing his friend's life depended on how fast he moved. The snowy ground was all around him, and every step was a fight against the weather. But Harrison kept going, pushed by a feeling of hurry and the need to help his friend. Twelve long hours passed before help arrived. At 8 p.m. on April 5th, a rescue team of 13 men, including members of the U.S. Forest Service, the Garfield County Sheriff's Department, the State Highway Patrol, and the Aspen Rescue Group, reached Groaning Cave. The team was well prepared, bringing a snowcat and three snowmobiles to get as close to the cave as possible. They knew that time was of the essence, and they moved quickly to reach Davis. When they got inside the cave, the rescue team carefully made their way to Davis, who was still conscious and in much pain. They gave him medicine to stop the pain and put a splint on his arm to keep it from hurting more. With the gate unlocked, they started the slow and careful job of taking Davis out of the cave. The snowy ground outside the cave's entrance made it even harder, but the team worked together to keep Davis safe. As they made their way to the waiting vehicles, something unexpected happened. The heavy splint, combined with the effects of the painkillers, caused Davis's dislocated shoulder to snap back into place. The intense pain suddenly eased, and the immediate danger of the injury was averted. By midnight, the rescue party was back on Deep Creek Road, exhausted but relieved that the ordeal was over. The accident at Groaning Cave showed the dangers of going caving, especially in winter. Being tired was the main reason for the accident, and not using a rope when climbing the chimney probably helped the person fall. Even if there were more people, the result could have been the same. The accident also showed how important it is to prepare and plan. Davis and Harrison could have avoided the bypass chimney if they had the key to the main entrance. The combination of being tired from climbing mountains in winter and the hard things about caving was very dangerous. For cavers, the incident underscored the importance of carrying strong painkillers and being prepared for emergencies. In situations where rescue is delayed, pain relief can make a significant difference, allowing the injured person to assist in their own rescue and prevent the onset of shock. However, such drugs should be used with caution and under medical guidance, as they can impair judgment and alertness. The story of Don Davis and Dave Harrison's harrowing experience in Groaning Cave is one of survival against the odds. It's a tale that reminds us of the unpredictability of nature and the importance of preparedness when exploring the unknown. Their adventure, which began with the thrill of discovery, quickly turned into a fight for survival. But through their resilience and the dedication of the rescue team, they emerged from the cave, battered but alive. As cavers continue to explore the depths of Groaning Cave, they do so with the knowledge that this remarkable place, while beautiful and awe-inspiring, demands respect and caution from all who enter. Welcome to the fascinating world of caves, where nature's wonders unfold in incredible formations. Today, we're exploring the amazing Rimstone River Cave in Missouri, a hidden gem for caving enthusiasts. Rimstone formations, also known as gourds, are a type of speleothem, which is a fancy word for cave formation. These natural structures look like stone dams and are made up of calcite and other minerals. They form in cave pools, creating stunning terraces that can stretch for hundreds of feet. One of the longest rimstone basins can be found in Tamze Biangfai in Laos, measuring up to 200 feet long. So, how do these rimstone dams form? It all starts with a gentle flow of water over the edge of a pool. The air, water, and rock meet, causing minerals to crystallize. The flowing water adds a bit of turbulence, helping the minerals to settle and form the rimstone's unique edges. When the water runs quickly, the dams grow taller, while slow-moving water creates lower, more winding formations. Rimstone is one of the most common cave formations, right after flowstone, stalactites, and stalagmites. The St. Genevieve County, Missouri, which is rich in history and boasts a diverse geological landscape, located just north of Perry County, this area was the heart of Missouri caving during the 1960s and 1970s. Perry County is home to some of the longest caves in the state. Crevice Cave is the longest at an impressive 31.2 miles. Barome Moor Cave follows at 18 miles, Mystery Cave at 15.7 miles, and our very own Rimstone River Cave at 14.2 miles, making it the fifth longest cave in Missouri. The Rimstone River Cave is a spectacular 16-mile-long cave system with seven entrances. It features a large passage stretching five miles with an underground river flowing from south to north, dividing into three siphons. The cave's upper and older passages connect with the river below. It's a breathtaking journey through a natural wonderland, but explorers must be cautious of potential floods. The cave is nestled in Ordovician carbonate rock, a type of ancient rock that adds to the cave's unique beauty. 
Our exploration will include a grid system map for navigation and detailed descriptions of 29 other smaller caves in the area, including Running Bull Cave, Snow Caverns, and Twin Cave System. On a cold winter morning in Missouri, December 6, 1969, a group of five young men set out on an adventure that would test their courage and resilience. Terry Pitchford, age 23, was the leader of this daring team, which also included Ron Kistner, 18, Gary Shacher, 22, and brothers Bob and Ron Benneke, age 20 and 18, respectively. These young men were passionate about exploring the unknown and driven by a deep craving to uncover the mysteries of the Rimstone River Cave. Their plan was to map an upstream side passage, an ambitious goal that required determination and teamwork. Terry, Ron Kistner, Gary, Bob, and Ron Benica were not just casual explorers. They were young men fueled by a thirst for adventure and discovery. The cave, with its winding passages and hidden secrets, offered a thrilling challenge that they couldn't resist. Despite the freezing temperatures and snow covering the ground, their enthusiasm for exploration was undeterred. They understood the risks involved, especially since the cave was known to flood during heavy rains. Outside, the weather was cold, with several inches of snow covering the ground. The forecast predicted showers, but the group felt confident about their journey. They were aware that heavy rains could flood the cave, but the excitement of exploration was too strong to resist. Inside the cave, the temperature was cool, with the air damp and filled with the echoing sounds of dripping water. The explorers trudged through the dark passages, their headlamps casting eerie shadows on the cave walls. The cave environment was breathtaking, with stalactites hanging from the ceilings and rimstone formations creating natural dams and terraces. The group entered Rimstone River Cave around 11 a.m., armed with their mapping equipment and inflatable boats. As they journeyed deeper into the cave, the air was cold and damp, a stark contrast to the frigid conditions outside. The cave's environment was both fascinating and eerie, with its dark, twisting passages and the sound of dripping water echoing through the chambers. The explorers were determined to reach the side passage, located about a mile from the entrance, where they planned to begin their mapping work. By 2 p.m., they had reached their destination. They carefully placed their inflatable boats 40 feet above the water level, a precautionary measure in case the water began to rise. The team then set to work, meticulously surveying the passage and recording their findings. The cave's beauty was mesmerizing, with intricate rock formations and mysterious shadows dancing along the walls. However, their focus remained on the task at hand, driven by the desire to uncover and document the cave's secrets. As the hours passed, the explorers were so busy in their work that they barely noticed the subtle changes in the cave's atmosphere. However, at around 6.25 p.m., they became aware of a disturbing development. The stream's volume had increased significantly. The water was rising quickly, a clear indication that the showers outside had turned into something more threatening. Within minutes, the water level had risen by four inches. The group faced a critical decision. Should they retreat to safety or continue their mapping efforts? Realizing the potential danger, the team decided to move farther into the cave where they knew there were high ceilings and dry ledges. They hurried through the passages, battling against the rising water, deep pools, and slippery rocks. The cave's temperature had dropped to a chilling 35 degree Fahrenheit, and the cold water was sapping their strength and energy. Despite these challenges, they pressed on, driven by a combination of fear and determination. Tragedy struck when Bob Benica, navigating a narrow ledge, lost his footing. The shale beneath him crumbled, causing him to fall and severely injure his knee. The injury was horrible, with his kneecap exposed and bleeding heavily. Despite the pain, Bob remained resilient, and the group continued moving until they found a seemingly safe area to regroup and assess their situation. As they tended to Bob's injury, Ron Kistner and Ron Benneke decided to search for an alternative exit, hoping to find a passage that might lead them closer to the surface. Unfortunately, their efforts were in vain, and they returned to the group around 1 a.m., unsuccessful but still hopeful. With the water continuing to rise and no alternative exit in sight, the group knew they had to make a difficult choice. They decided that Kistner and Ron Benneke would attempt to leave the cave immediately and seek help. If they didn't return by 6 a.m., Terry, Gary, and Bob would follow them, hoping to make it out safely. The night passed slowly, with the three remaining explorers sleeping fitfully, their minds filled with uncertainty and worry. As dawn approached, Terry, Gary, and Bob prepared to make their escape. The journey back was fraught with danger. They had to navigate narrow passages with only six inches of airspace, a terrifying reminder of the cave's power and unpredictability. The rushing water was a constant threat, and the cold made every movement painful and exhausting. 
Near the cave's entrance, the explorers faced their final and most daunting challenge, a 35-feet ladder leading up through what had become a roaring torrent. The water pounded against them as they climbed, each step requiring immense effort and concentration. By sheer determination, they managed to reach the surface at around 11 a.m., exhausted but relieved to be free from the cave's grasp. Meanwhile, Kistner and Ron Benneke had successfully reached the surface earlier and had contacted other cavers for help. A backup crew was ready to launch a rescue mission if the three remaining explorers did not appear by noon. Fortunately, the entire group made it out safely, their ordeal a testament to their bravery and the unbreakable bonds formed in the face of adversity. The daring adventure in Rimstone River Cave taught the group many important lessons. The accident happened because the explorers were moving too quickly through a passage with tricky footing. The melting snow outside was the real cause of the water rising in the cave, something they hadn't fully considered before entering. Thankfully, Bob Bennick's injury, although severe, did not incapacitate him, and he was able to walk with the group to safety. Had he been unable to move, the situation could have been much more serious and potentially life-threatening. After this experience, the team realized the importance of being better prepared for unexpected events. They started planning to place survival kits in key areas of the cave. These kits would include essentials like food, water, blankets, and first aid supplies. Having these supplies on hand could be crucial for survival if explorers ever find themselves trapped by rising waters again. Moreover, the group decided to set stricter limits on cave exploration trips, especially when the weather is bad. They learned the hard way that weather conditions, such as rain or melting snow, can significantly impact the safety of their expeditions. Diving into the depths of a crystal clear spring, where every turn in the underwater cave reveals something new and unknown, two young men, full of excitement and passion, decide to explore the mysterious cave system beneath Little River Springs. But as they venture deeper into the dark, twisting tunnels, something goes terribly wrong. What happens next is a story that will keep you on the edge of your seat. In this thrilling video, we'll uncover the chilling details of their dive into the unknown. Located in the heart of natural North Florida, Little River Springs is a picturesque 125-acre county park located on the scenic Suwannee River. This natural gem offers a perfect blend of outdoor activities and wildlife viewing, making it an ideal destination for nature lovers. With two walking trails winding through the park, Visitors have the opportunity to immerse themselves in nature, spotting deer, squirrels, and a variety of birds along the way. The spring at Little River Springs remains a constant 72 degrees throughout the year, providing a refreshing oasis no matter the season. Whether you're looking to swim, snorkel, canoe, or kayak, the cool, clear waters of the spring offer a welcoming escape. In the summer, the water feels like a natural air conditioner, while in the winter, it provides a warm and inviting retreat. One of the park's most fascinating features is its underwater cave system, which attracts scuba divers from around the world. The spring run is approximately 150 feet long, leading into a cave system that extends over 1,200 feet beneath the surface. Divers are drawn to this hidden world, always excited to explore the mysteries that lie beneath the ground. Little River Springs is a second magnitude spring, meaning the water flow from the spring vent is remarkably strong. The spring water rises from a crack in the limestone floor, creating a spring basin that spans about 108 feet from north to south and 93 feet from east to west. The depth of the spring vent can vary, but it is usually around 11 feet deep, with other areas of the basin being as shallow as 2 feet. The basin floor is a mix of exposed limestone and sand, adding to the natural beauty of the site. The water in Little River Springs is usually a stunning emerald blue, providing a striking contrast to the dark, tannic waters of the Suwannee. This difference in water color is one of the unique features of the spring, offering visitors a visual treat as they watch the clear spring water blend with the tea-colored river. During the time of high water levels in the Suwannee River, the dark, tannic waters can mix with the spring water, causing what is known as brown-out conditions. This reduces the visibility in the spring, but on clear days, the sight of the spring run's smooth, curving flow is truly mesmerizing. Under the right conditions, the water in the run is so clear that it appears almost invisible, allowing visitors to peer directly into the cavern entrance while standing on a limestone shelf just below the surface. Little River Springs is not just a haven for divers and swimmers. It's also a family-friendly destination. Several shallow areas make it a safe spot for children to wade and play in the water. The park is well-equipped with three handicap-accessible pavilion areas with grills, making it perfect for picnics. 
Additionally, there are two overlooks, portable restrooms, and paved sidewalks, ensuring a comfortable visit for everyone. Despite its popularity, Little River Springs remains one of the more alluring natural sights in Florida. When the water is calm and clear, the beauty of the spring and its run to the Suwannee River is simply unmatched. For those seeking adventure or simply a peaceful day in nature, Little River Springs offers a unique and unforgettable experience. On January 25, 1970 at Little River Springs, Florida, a place known for its stunning underwater caves and natural beauty. Two young men, Al Oliver and Aaron McKnight, both just 20 years old, set out on what was supposed to be an exciting dive into the depths of the springs. Both men were passionate about diving, with a shared love for exploring the hidden underwater worlds that most people never get to see. Their enthusiasm for cave diving brought them to Little River Springs, a place they had likely dreamed of exploring for a long time. But what began as an adventure soon turned into a devastating tragedy. Al and Aaron were not just casual divers, they had a deep passion for the sport. They had spent countless hours preparing for dives, learning about the intricate details of cave systems, and honing their skills. The thrill of diving into a cave system, navigating through tight passages, and discovering the secrets hidden below the surface was what fueled their passion. They were aware of the risks involved in cave diving, but believed that their preparation and dedication would keep them safe. Little River Springs, with its crystal clear waters and extensive cave system, was the perfect spot for such an adventure. The spring's water remains a constant 72 degrees, making it ideal for diving year-round. The cave system beneath the spring offers a labyrinth of passages that only the most skilled divers dare to explore. For Al and Aaron, this was an opportunity to challenge themselves and experience the thrill of navigating these underwater caves. As they descended into the depths of the cave, they were likely filled with excitement and adventure. The underwater world they entered was a place of beauty and mystery, with limestone formations and tunnels that seemed to go on forever. But cave diving is not just about beauty, it requires precise planning, an acute awareness of time and careful management of air supply. Unfortunately, something went wrong during their dive. It was later concluded that Al and Aaron miscalculated the air they had left in their tanks. In the intricate and often disorienting environment of a cave, it can be easy to lose track of time and how much air is being used. The deep passages of the cave, combined with the mental and physical strain of navigating through tight spaces, can quickly reduce a diver's air supply. Realizing their mistake, they would have tried to return to the surface, but the cave's complexity made it difficult to find their way back in time. The panic of realizing that their air was running low must have been terrifying. Cave diving leaves little room for error, and the stakes are incredibly high. In the dark, enclosed space of the cave, every second counts. The urgency to find their way out would have been overwhelming, but the twists and turns of the cave made it nearly impossible. Despite their best efforts, Al and Aaron couldn't make it back to the surface. When they failed to surface, a rescue operation was launched. The diving community is a close-knit one, and news of a missing diver spreads quickly. Rescue divers, who are highly skilled and trained in cave diving, were called to the scene. These divers know the risks involved in attempting a rescue in such dangerous conditions, but they are driven by a commitment to help their fellow divers. The rescue team likely entered the water with hope, but also with the knowledge that the chances of a successful outcome were not so high. The rescue divers navigated the same treacherous passages that Al and Aaron had explored, searching for any signs of the two men. They had to move carefully, knowing that any mistake could put their own lives in danger. The cave's narrow passages and limited visibility made the search incredibly challenging. Despite the rescue team's best efforts, Al and Aaron were found too late. They had died from the lack of air, their bodies discovered deep within the cave system. It was a heartbreaking end to a dive that had started with so much promise and excitement. The news of their deaths sent shockwaves through the diving community and beyond, serving as a warning of the dangers in cave diving. The loss of Al Oliver and Aaron McKnight highlights the unpredictable nature of cave diving. Even the most experienced and passionate divers can fall victim to the risk of this sport. It requires not only skill and preparation, but also a deep respect for the risks involved. In the wake of their deaths, there was likely much reflection within the diving community about the importance of safety, the need for thorough planning, and the critical importance of monitoring air supply. The tragedy at Little River Springs serves as a sobering reminder of the fine line between adventure and danger in the world of cave diving. For Al and Aaron, their passion for diving led them to pursue an incredible adventure, but it also led to their untimely deaths. As we remember Al Oliver and Aaron McKnight, we honor their passion and their adventurous spirits. 
Their love for diving took them to places few have ventured, and their story will not be forgotten. Their loss is a reminder to all divers of the importance of safety and the ever-present risks that come with exploring the depths of our world's caves. As we wrap up this video, we hope Al and Aaron's story reminds everyone of the importance of safety and careful planning in all adventures. Deep within the mysterious passages of Breathing Cave, a group of adventurous young cavers set out to explore its hidden wonders. Their goal was simple, to navigate the challenging passages and reach the breathtaking waterfall deep within the cave. But as they ventured further, something went wrong. What happened in those dark, twisting tunnels? Were they prepared for the challenges that lay ahead? Let's uncover the chilling events that unfolded deep underground, where every decision could mean the difference between life and death. We are exploring one of Virginia's most popular wild caves, Breathing Cave, located in Bath County. This cave is a favorite among cavers due to its extensive passages, complex layout, and numerous vertical obstacles. Stretching over four and a half miles, Breathing Cave has challenged cavers for decades. Breathing Cave is a rare type of cave known as a barometric cave. In these caves, air flows in and out due to differences in atmospheric pressure between the inside and outside. While most caves experience airflow because of temperature differences, barometric caves like Breathing Cave have air moving because of pressure changes. When the air pressure outside the cave is higher, air blows into the cave, and when the pressure inside is higher, air blows out. If the pressures are equal, there is no airflow. Breathing Cave is part of a larger cave system that includes Butler Cave. Together, they feature remarkable natural wonders such as a 40-foot waterfall, a natural bridge, unique floating crystalline formations, and an underground lake. These stunning features make the cave system a must-see for any cave enthusiast. When planning your visit to Breathing Cave, it's essential to use the designated parking area and trail, which were changed by the cave owner a few years ago. The parking area is located on Route 609, about 200 yards northeast of the Bath Highland County line. If you are coming from the northeast, the trailhead is 3.4 miles southwest on Burnsville Road, Route 609, when heading towards Burnsville, Virginia, from the Route 678 intersection. If you are coming from the southwest, the trailhead is 2.7 miles northeast from Burnsville, Virginia, on Route 609. On the bright afternoon of May 28th, a group of six excited cavers gathered at the entrance of Breathing Cave, located in Bath County, Virginia. Among them were Phil Gettle, 25, Lee Gettle, 23, Jim Young, 17, Joe Chiara, 15, Dale Iberson, 20, and J. Herbin, 33. Their goal was a daring adventure through the cave's new section to the mesmerizing waterfall that many had spoken of. With all but two of the team members having explored Breathing Cave before, they felt confident and excited about the journey ahead. Breathing Cave is a popular spot among cavers due to its challenging passages and unique features. As a barometric cave, air flows in and out due to atmospheric pressure changes. This fascinating natural phenomenon adds an extra layer of intrigue for those exploring its depths. At about 12.30 p.m., the group entered the cave, eager to explore its wonders. They proceeded at a leisurely pace, stopping to investigate side passages and marvel at the cave's natural beauty. They reached the Cathedral Passage just before 2 p.m., a 300-foot-long canyon with a high ceiling. The passage offered two routes, a lower path involving crawling through wet passages and an upper route requiring more technical skills, such as canyon hopping and chimneying. The group chose the upper route, seeking the thrill of the challenge. As they crossed the canyon past the Splattermite climb, four members had successfully made it to the other side when it was 15-year-old Joe Chiara's turn. Straddling the canyon, he used ledges on both sides as footholds. Suddenly, Chiara lost his footing and fell 50 feet to the lower level. The only sound he made was a brief, uh, which was enough for Iberson to see him plummeting down. The fall was sudden and unexpected, leaving the group in shock. Immediately, Young and the Gettle brothers descended to reach Chiara to know about his condition. It was clear he was badly injured. In a race against time, Herbane hurried back to the surface to get help, instructing another group of cavers to contact the Potomac Speleological Club Fieldhouse and the Cave Rescue Communications Network. Herbine then returned with essential supplies, including a rope, blanket, and plastic sheet, hoping to provide some comfort and aid to Kiara. As time passed, Kiara's condition got worse. His breathing became weaker until, at 4.15 p.m., it stopped completely. 
Even though they tried to revive him with artificial respiration, there was no response. Lee Gettle and Iberson had already left the cave earlier, but the others stayed behind, hoping for a miracle. Sadly, Kiara's injuries were too serious, and he passed away in the cave, surrounded by his friends. Rescue teams began arriving shortly after 5 p.m., and the difficult task of recovering Kiara's body started at 7.30 p.m. The operation was completed by 11.45 p.m., and the Bath County coroner later confirmed that Kiara had died from a concussion, possibly a broken neck and internal injuries. He also suffered cuts, a fractured wrist, and a dislocated leg. Kiara had been wearing an MSA Comfo cap, a type of hard hat that provided no real protection during the fall. The cap remained on his head because of the chin strap, but it functioned mainly as a lamp carrier rather than a safety helmet. This tragic incident raised important questions about caving safety and the responsibilities of experienced cavers towards beginners. Many people wondered if the group had thought Kiara was more capable than he was, and if they should have taken more precautions to guide and protect those with less experience. It's important for experienced cavers to be careful, supportive, and helpful, especially when their companions are new to difficult environments. Furthermore, this accident highlighted the need to reassess the perceived difficulty of caves like Breathing Cave. Although it is considered relatively easy, the complexity and potential hazards it presents should not be underestimated. The journey took only 20 minutes for the group to reach the point of the accident, but it took over four hours to carry Kiara's body out. Handling a live rescue under such conditions would have been incredibly challenging, possibly requiring the setup of a makeshift hospital inside the cave. The thirst for exploration among young cavers is natural and inspiring, driven by a desire to discover the hidden wonders beneath the Earth's surface. However, this enthusiasm must be tempered with caution, awareness, and respect for the dangers that lie within these mysterious environments. This story highlights the need for proper preparation, communication, and vigilance. Experienced cavers should take extra care to guide and protect those with less experience. While the hunger of discovery drives us, we must remember to respect the power of nature and the challenges it presents. In the dark, twisting depths of Dynamite Cave, a photographer named Dave Albert set out to capture the hidden beauty of the underground world. But something went terribly wrong. A sudden explosion shattered the silence, leaving behind a scene of chaos. What happened deep in that cave? How did a simple photograph turn into a dangerous encounter with the unknown? Let's uncover the mystery of what went wrong down there. Welcome to Dynamite Cave, one of the longest and most intriguing caves in the Trout Lake area of Washington. This extensive lava tube cave stretches for 12,345 feet and is filled with vertical drops, deep pits, and multiple levels, making it a challenging and exciting spot for explorers. Discovered in 1958, this cave has a fascinating history, but it's not without its dangers. The cave got its name from a dramatic event. Shortly after its discovery, vandals used dynamite to blast the entrance, causing a massive collapse. Tons of rock were tightly packed, sealing off the entrance and leaving other large rocks precariously balanced. This act of vandalism didn't just block the cave, it left a huge mark on its history, making it a place of both mystery and scientific interest. The entrance to Dynamite Cave is at the base of a 30-feet cliff. The cave begins with a slope that extends 680 feet into a broad chamber. This chamber is warm and home to many insects during the summer. Above this chamber is an upper-level tube that's about 200 feet long and 6 feet in diameter. The main route of the cave continues as a spacious corridor filled with breakdown, which is when parts of the cave's ceiling or walls have collapsed. One of the unique features of this cave is its intricate lava formations. As you move deeper into the cave, the passage narrows and rises, eventually leading to a 15-foot ledge that drops down into the intermediate section of the cave. This section is complex, with parts extending far north under the entrance and a main route that heads south. The southern part of the intermediate section is 950 feet long and ends at a 40 feet deep lava-walled pit. This pit is a key point in the cave, connecting three major levels. Beyond this pit, the cave's passages become even more complex, with multiple sublevels, natural bridges, and glazed lava walls. The sublevels slope down toward the lowest part of the cave, where you'll find the Grand Ballroom, a large, impressive chamber about 50 feet in diameter. From the Grand Ballroom, the lower level tube continues for another 650 feet before reaching a 55 feet pit. 
This section of the cave is less explored and has some unique features, like flow patterns and lava falls. However, navigating this part requires a high level of skill and special equipment. The cave's formation, or speleogenesis, is complex, with different lava flow levels interweaving throughout its length. The entrance chamber is teeming with life, including insects and bats, but deeper into the cave, life becomes sparse. Dynamite Cave isn't just a natural wonder. It's a place that holds both danger and intrigue, with a history marked by human impact and natural beauty. Dave Albert was a passionate photographer with a deep love for capturing the hidden wonders of nature. His fascination with caves began early in his life, and it wasn't long before he became known for his stunning photographs of underground landscapes. His work wasn't just about taking pictures, it was about bringing the beauty and mystery of these dark, untouched places to the world above. Albert was dedicated to his craft, often venturing into caves that few dared to explore. His photographs showcased the eerie beauty of stalactites hanging like crystals from the ceiling, the flowing curves of ancient lava tubes, and the delicate formations that had taken thousands of years to form. His attention to detail and his ability to capture the play of light and shadow made his images stand out. Each photograph told a story of a hidden world waiting to be discovered. One of the caves that particularly intrigued Albert was Dynamite Cave in Washington. This cave, with its complex system of vertical drops, deep pits, and multiple levels, was a challenge for any explorer, but for a photographer, it was a treasure trove of opportunities. The cave had a unique history, having been partly sealed off by vandals who used dynamite to close the entrance. This made it even more intriguing for Albert, as he was drawn to places with a story, places that had seen both natural and human forces at work. In 1969, on a day that seemed like any other, Dave Albert set out to capture the wonders of Dynamite Cave. He was well prepared, as always, carrying his camera equipment and other necessary gear. One of the essential tools in his kit was a strobe flash unit, which he used to illuminate the dark, hidden corners of the cave. The strobe flash was powerful, allowing him to light up the cave and reveal details that would otherwise be lost in the shadows. As Albert made his way deeper into the cave, he was excited about the shots he was getting. The cave's natural formations were even more stunning in person, and he was excited to capture them. He had spent about an hour in the cave, carefully choosing his angles and adjusting his camera settings to get the perfect shots. The strobe flash unit had been stored in a sealed ammunition can during his hike into the cave, along with some used carbide. Carbide is a substance often used in caving to produce acetylene gas, which can be used to fuel lamps. Unbeknownst to Albert, this combination was about to create a dangerous situation. As Albert set up his camera for another shot, he tripped the camera's shutter, sinking it with the strobe flash unit. Suddenly, a sharp explosion echoed through the cave. The strobe flash unit had exploded with a loud bang. The force of the explosion was so strong that the case of the unit split lengthwise. The lens and lamp tube were blown forward, and the F-number calculator, a small device used to adjust the camera's aperture, flew through the air, striking Albert on his hard hat and glasses frame. At that moment, everything happened so quickly that Albert barely had time to react. The explosion was unexpected and shocking, but fortunately, his protective gear had done its job. His helmet and glasses shielded him from any serious injury. Though shaken, Albert was unharmed. He took a moment to gather himself, realizing just how close he had come to a potentially life-threatening accident. The cause of the explosion became clear after the incident. The strobe unit had been stored in the sealed ammunition can with the used carbide, which was still producing acetylene gas. This gas had likely seeped into the strobe unit's case, creating an explosive mixture. When the camera shutter synced with the strobe, the electrical spark ignited the gas, causing the explosion. While Albert was incredibly fortunate to escape unharmed, the incident served as a stark reminder of the dangers that can arise in caves. Fire and explosions are major hazards, especially in environments where gases like acetylene can accumulate. Caves, while fascinating and beautiful, are also unpredictable places, and the risks can be great. For Albert, this close call reinforced the importance of safety in his work. He knew that he had been lucky, but he also understood that the next person might not be so fortunate. He began sharing his story with others, not just as a cautionary tale, but as a lesson in the importance of preparation and awareness when exploring caves. He stressed the need for proper gear, knowledge of the environment, and an understanding of the potential hazards. Albert continued his photography work after the incident, but with an even greater respect for the power of nature and the dangers that can lurk in the dark corners of the earth. 
His photographs continued to inspire awe and wonder, but they also carried a message that exploration, while rewarding, must always be approached with caution. The incident in Dynamite Cave remains a significant event in Dave Albert's career, a moment that could have ended in tragedy, but instead became a powerful lesson in the importance of safety in cave exploration. A sunny day at Ice Caves Mountain, where a group of boys and a mother set out for a fun adventure. The morning is filled with excitement as they explore the beautiful paths and marvel at the wonders of the caves. But what happens when three of the boys decide to venture off on their own, ignoring warning signs and stepping into the unknown? What happens next is a chilling mystery. How did a simple exploration turn into a life-threatening ordeal? What went wrong down there? Watch the video to uncover the dark secrets. Welcome to the beautiful Hudson Valley in New York, home to the stunning Minnewaska State Park Preserve. Covering over 24,000 acres, this park is a nature lover's paradise with its numerous hiking trails, sparkling lakes, and breathtaking waterfalls. Among its two main areas, the Sam's Point area in Cragsmoor is especially famous for the mysterious and fascinating ice caves the Ellenville Fault. Ice caves, as they're formerly known, are a hidden gem in the Hudson Valley. They were designated as a national natural landmark in 1967 due to their unique geological features and ecological importance. Unlike most caves in the Northeast, which are formed from limestone, the Ellenville ice caves are made from a hard quartz conglomerate. Most caves form when water slowly bites the limestone, creating large, open caverns. But here, the tectonic movements have separated the rock along existing joints, creating deep crevices and small caverns. These formations are part of the largest known exposed fault system in the United States, known as the Ellenville Fault. One of the most remarkable things about the Ellenville ice caves is their ability to stay cool all year round. Even during the hottest summer days, these caves remain icy. This natural refrigeration system is thanks to the deep crevices and small caverns sheltered from the sun. These areas maintain temperatures near or below freezing, allowing ice to preserve late into the summer and often until the next winter. The cool environment has created a unique microclimate that supports plants usually found much further north or at higher elevations. You can find stands of northern and alpine plants, like black spruce and mountain ash, thriving in this unusual setting. To explore these fascinating caves, you'll need to head to the Sam's Point area of Minnewaska State Park, located between Ellenville and Newburgh, New York. The journey to the ice caves is part of the adventure. A four-mile round-trip hike over well-maintained trails, mostly paved, will lead you to these natural wonders. While it used to be possible to drive right up to the entrance, the hike is now a significant part of the experience, adding to the anticipation as you approach the caves. In the 1990s, a non-profit organization purchased the caves and the nearby ridgetop. This helped protect the area's natural beauty, eventually becoming part of Minnewaska State Park in 2015. The caves have been restored to their natural appearance, with only a few additions like ladders, railings, and solar-powered lights to ensure visitor safety while preserving the environment. Whether you're a seasoned hiker or just someone looking for a cool escape during the summer, the Ellenville Ice Caves offer a unique and unforgettable experience. The combination of stunning natural beauty, fascinating geology, and a refreshing climate makes this destination a must-visit for anyone exploring the Hudson Valley. So, lace up your hiking boots, pack some water, and get ready to discover the icy wonders of New York's hidden caves. On April 11, 1969, a group of six boys, accompanied by the mother of two of them, decided to spend a day exploring the Ice Caves Mountain Tourist Attraction. It was a sunny morning, and the boys were excited to discover the wonders of the area. They spent the morning touring the public paths, marveling at the beauty of the ice caves and enjoying their time together. The group consisted of Ted Wunderlich Jr., who was 17 years old, his younger brother Michael, aged 9, and their friend John Budion, who was 16. The other three boys were not named in the reports. The boys had a strong desire for adventure, always looking for new places to explore. They loved the thrill of discovering new and hidden spots, which sometimes led them to ignore safety rules. After spending the morning on the safe, public paths, Ted, Michael, and John decided to venture off on their own. Their curiosity led them to the end of an area known as the Crystal Chasm. Despite numerous warning signs and a fenced area meant to keep visitors safe, the boys ignored the barriers and walked towards a cave-like entrance. Ted, being the oldest, took the lead. 
He pulled out a flashlight and walked into the cave first. The narrow cave was dark and mysterious, but the boys were eager to see what was inside. They walked about 25 feet into the cave when the tragic accident happened. As Ted was leading the way with his flashlight, Michael suddenly darted in front of him. Perhaps excited or just curious, Michael didn't realize the danger that lay ahead. In the darkness, he stepped off a ledge and fell into total blackness. The opening he fell through was only two to three feet wide, making it impossible to see what was below. Michael fell 40 feet down the narrow opening and landed in an underground stream. The fall was devastating. Ted and John, shocked and terrified, immediately called for help. They were desperate to save their friend and brother, but there was nothing they could do from their position. The boy's cries for help quickly drew the attention of other visitors and park staff. Emergency services were called, and a rescue operation was launched. Rescue teams arrived swiftly, equipped with ropes, harnesses, and other necessary gear to navigate the dangerous cave. The rescuers worked tirelessly to reach Michael. They had to be very careful, as the narrow opening and underground stream made the operation extremely difficult. After several hours of intense effort, they finally reached Michael. Unfortunately, it was too late. Michael's body was recovered later that day, and the news was devastating for everyone involved. The accident left Ted and John in a state of shock. They were overwhelmed with guilt and grief, unable to comprehend the tragic turn of events. The mother who had accompanied the group was heartbroken. She had brought the boys to the park for a day of fun and adventure, never imagining it would end in such tragedy. The news of Michael's death spread quickly, and the entire community was affected. Friends and family gathered to support the Wunderlich family during this incredibly difficult time. Vigils were held, and people shared their condolences, trying to offer some comfort in the face of such a heartbreaking loss. Ted, Michael, and John's love for adventure was well known among their friends and family. They were always eager to explore new places, driven by a thirst for discovery and excitement. This passion for adventure is common among many young people, but it also comes with risks. The tragic accident at Ice Caves Mountain serves as a stark reminder of the importance of respecting safety guidelines and understanding the potential dangers of exploring unfamiliar places. The tragic incident at Ice Caves Mountain led to increased safety measures at the park. Authorities reviewed and reinforced the existing barriers and warning signs to prevent future accidents. Educational programs were also introduced to teach visitors about the dangers of ignoring safety precautions. For the Wunderlich family and their friends, the loss of Michael was a life-changing event. They were left to cope with their grief and the painful memories of that day. However, they also hoped that sharing their story would help others understand the importance of staying safe while exploring and enjoying nature. The story of Ted, Michael, and John is a poignant reminder of the delicate balance between adventure and safety. While the craving of exploration is strong, it is crucial to always be aware of the risks and take necessary precautions. The tragic accident at Ice Caves Mountain serves as a lesson for all adventurers, young and old, to respect nature's boundaries and prioritize safety above all else. As we remember Michael and reflect on this story, let's honor his memory by enjoying our adventures responsibly. Whether you're hiking, caving, or simply exploring new places, make sure to follow all safety rules and be aware of your surroundings. Nature offers us incredible experiences, but it's up to us to keep those experiences safe and enjoyable. A beautiful autumn day filled with excitement and exploration, where the beauty of nature meets the mysteries of history. On a chilly November weekend, a dedicated teacher leads a group of children to the depths of Bullmine Mountain. But what begins as an adventure soon takes a terrifying turn. As they venture into the unknown mine shafts, something goes terribly wrong. What happened in the darkness below? How did an exciting outing become a life-changing experience for everyone involved? Let's uncover the unknown facts about the gripping story behind this tragic adventure. Exploring old mines is a thrilling adventure that captures the imagination of many cave enthusiasts. These underground sites are like time capsules, preserving the history of an era long gone. However, mine exploration also comes with significant risks due to unstable structures and risky conditions. Despite these dangers, the hunger of discovering hidden stories and unique geological features continues to draw adventurers to these mysterious places. The Bull Iron Mine, located in South Blooming Grove, New York, offers a glimpse into the region's rich mining history. South Blooming Grove is part of the picturesque Monroe Mining District, nestled within the Appalachian National Scenic Trail. 
This area is known for its beautiful landscapes, high elevations, and rugged terrain, which were shaped by geological forces over millions of years. The Bull Iron Mine itself is currently inactive, with no plans to resume operations. During its active years, it was a relatively small producer of magnetite, a type of iron ore with magnetic properties. The mine played a significant role in the 19th century, primarily operated by the Parrott brothers, Robert and Peter. Though its early history is not well documented, the mine became an important source of iron ore over time. In 1880, after Robert's death in 1877, Peter Parrott led the operations under the newly formed Parrott Iron Company. That year, the mine produced over 2,575 tons of ore, mainly extracted from an old pillar just 100 feet below the surface. By 1881, the mine's total output had reached 52,000 tons of ore. This ore was roasted on site before being transported to the Clove and Greenwood furnaces, where it was used to make foundry hardware. Unfortunately, the Bull Iron Mine was permanently abandoned in 1884. Its workings consisted of large open stopes, inclined shafts, a vertical shaft, and an adit at the hill's base, likely used for drainage. The magnetite vein was quite extensive, measuring about 100 feet by 10 feet and pitching at an angle of 40 degrees. Drifts, or horizontal tunnels, were run through the ore body at various levels, and the mine is believed to have reached a total depth of 1,000 feet. Today, the site is part of the historical fabric of the region, surrounded by the natural beauty of the New England upland section of the Appalachian Highlands. Although the original structures, including ore roasters and dwellings, are no longer present, the Bull Iron Mine remains a testament to the industrious spirit of the past and a fascinating site for those interested in the history of mining and exploration. On a crisp November weekend in 1969, Walter Kursevich, a young and passionate physical education teacher, embarked on a memorable outing with a group of children from the McQuaid Foundation Home for Children. The McQuaid Foundation Home, located in New Windsor, New York, was a place of hope and support for children in need, providing them with education and guidance. Kursevich, just 22 years old, was dedicated to enriching the lives of the children under his care often organizing outdoor adventures to inspire and educate them. On November 22, 1969, Kersavage led a group of 15 excited children to Bull Mine Mountain, a place known for its natural beauty and intriguing history. The trip was intended to be a day of exploration and fun, giving the children a chance to experience the outdoors and learn about the area's mining heritage. Bull Mine Mountain, with its abandoned mine shafts and rugged terrain, offered a fascinating backdrop for such an adventure. As the group explored the mountain, Kersevage spotted one of the old mine shafts and decided to investigate. Driven by curiosity and a sense of adventure, he attempted to enter the mine shaft by descending hand over hand on a half-inch rope. However, he didn't have the proper equipment and wasn't much experienced for this kind of such dangerous descent. Around 3 p.m., tragedy struck when Kersevage lost his grip on the rope and fell nearly 100 feet into the dark shaft below. The impact of Kersevich's fall was devastating. The children, who had been enjoying their day, were suddenly faced with a horrifying scene. They were terrified and in shock, unsure of what to do as their beloved teacher lay injured at the bottom of the mine shaft. The sense of adventure quickly turned into a nightmare, leaving the children feeling helpless and scared. In the aftermath of the accident, emergency services were called to the scene. Rescuers faced the challenging task of reaching Kersevage, who was trapped deep inside the mine. The rescue operation was complex and dangerous, requiring careful planning and coordination to ensure the safety of both the rescuers and the children who remained at the site. Despite their best efforts, rescuers eventually reached Kersevage, but were unable to save his life. The emotional toll on the children was profound. Many of them were left traumatized by the experience struggling to process the loss of their teacher and the frightening events they had witnessed. Counselors and support staff from the McQuaid Foundation Home worked tirelessly to provide emotional support and guidance to help the children cope with their grief. In the days following the accident, the community rallied around the children and the McQuaid Foundation Home, offering condolences and support. Walter Kersevage was remembered as a dedicated and caring teacher who had made a positive impact on the lives of the children he worked with. His tragic death highlighted the need for greater awareness and caution when exploring potentially hazardous environments. 
This tragic incident can be compared to the Level Crevice accident in Iowa in 1967, where a group of cavers faced a similar situation due to inexperience and a lack of proper equipment. In that incident, a group of novice cavers attempted to explore the Level Crevice cave without adequate preparation. One of the cavers, Richard Fisher, became trapped and ultimately lost his life. Both incidents serve as poignant reminders of the importance of proper training, equipment, and respect for the inherent dangers of exploring caves and mines. The Bull Mine Mountain incident, like the Level Crevice accident, underscored the importance of safety and preparedness in outdoor exploration. It served as a stark reminder that even the most well-intentioned adventures could quickly turn dangerous without the proper knowledge and equipment. In the years since, organizations and educators have placed greater emphasis on safety training and risk assessment to prevent similar tragedies. As the children and staff of the McQuaid Foundation home continued to heal from the loss of Curse of Age, they carried forward his spirit of adventure and learning, ensuring that future outings were conducted with a heightened awareness of safety and preparation. The memory of that fateful day on Bull Mine Mountain remains a sobering lesson in the balance between curiosity and caution, a testament to the enduring impact of Kersevich's dedication to his students. Walter Kersevich's love for teaching and his desire to inspire the children from the McQuaid Foundation home left a lasting impact, despite the tragic outcome of that day on Bull Mine Mountain. Setting out on an exciting adventure in one of the world's largest and most mysterious cave systems. But what happens when things go terribly wrong? On June 23rd, a group ventured into the Rio Kamui cave, expecting to capture its hidden beauty on film. Little did they know, they were about to face unexpected dangers. What went wrong down there? Join us to uncover the shocking details of their perilous journey. Located in the northwestern region of Puerto Rico, the Rio Camuay Cave Park is a mesmerizing destination for cave enthusiasts and adventurers alike. Spanning across three towns, Camuay, Hatillo, and Lares, this park offers a unique glimpse into one of the world's largest cave systems. The main entrance to this natural wonder is located in the Quebrada area of Camuy, welcoming visitors to explore its depths. The Rio Camuy Cave Park is a network of stunning natural limestone caves and underground rivers. These formations were carved out by the Rio Camuy, the third largest underground river on Earth. Although officially discovered in 1958, archaeological evidence suggests that the island's indigenous Taino people explored these caves hundreds of years ago. With over 10 miles of caverns, 220 mapped caves, and 17 entrances, the Kamui cave system is vast. Experts believe there are still another 800 caves waiting to be discovered. Despite its size, only a small part of this complex cave system is open to the public, and visitors need reservations to experience its breathtaking beauty. The park spans 268 acres and features tours of selected caves and sinkholes. These tours are a popular attraction in Puerto Rico, drawing tourists and researchers alike. As you delve into the depths of the caves, you'll encounter awe-inspiring features like towering ceilings and rivers flowing through the caverns. The diverse ecosystem within the caves is home to various species of bats, birds, and insects, adding to the park's allure. The Rio Camuy Cave Park is not just a tourist destination, but also an essential scientific and ecological resource. Ongoing research focuses on the cave's geology, hydrology, and ecology, as well as the surrounding ecosystems. This makes the park a vital center for scientific exploration and environmental preservation. In addition to its natural wonders, the park offers amenities for visitors, including a visitor center, picnic areas, souvenir shops, food vendors, and an exhibition hall. These facilities ensure that visitors have a comfortable and informative experience as they explore the underground marvels of Rio Camuy Cave Park. The park has faced challenges, including damage from Hurricane Maria in 2017 and Hurricane Fiona in 2022. However, it has undergone restorations and reopened to the public, allowing visitors to continue experiencing its natural beauty. Today, the Rio Camuy Cave Park stands as a testament to Puerto Rico's rich natural heritage and its enduring spirit of exploration and discovery. In 1968, on Sunday, June 23rd, a group of about 15 people, including men, women, and children, ventured into the depths of the Rio Camuy Cave Park. Their goal was to film a documentary and capture the cave's stunning beauty on camera. 
Entering the cave was no simple task. The group had to wear life preservers and either wade or swim with the help of a lifeline to reach a landing known as the National Geographic Hall. The journey into the cave was filled with excitement and a sense of adventure as they marveled at the intricate limestone formations and underground waterways. The Rio Kamui cave system, known for its vast network of caverns carved by the powerful Rio Kamui, is one of the world's largest and most impressive underground river systems. However, this breathtaking natural wonder also harbors hidden dangers, especially for those unprepared for its unpredictable nature. The river can rise rapidly and unexpectedly, transforming the cave from a place of awe to one of peril. As the group finished their exploration and prepared to leave the cave, disaster struck. The river's water suddenly rose to waist-deep levels within minutes, trapping them in a potentially life-threatening situation. While most of the people of the group managed to retreat to higher ground in the National Geographic Hall, five individuals decided to push forward and attempt to swim to the cave's entrance. The rising water created a powerful current, making the swim treacherous and demanding. Four of them successfully navigated the swirling waters, but one was not as fortunate. Hector Buesco, a 32-year-old member of the group, was swept away from the safety of the lifeline by the strong current. Holding onto but not wearing his life preserver, he was pulled along the bottom of the Tres Pueblos sinkhole and into the downstream entrance of the cave system. Despite an extensive search of the downstream portion of the cave, there was no sign of Buesco and he was presumed drowned. This tragic incident underscores the potential dangers of exploring the Rio Kamui cave without proper equipment and guidance. While the allure of the cave is undeniable, it is crucial to approach such adventures with respect and caution. The river's unpredictable nature and the cave's complex network make it a challenging environment, especially for novices or casual visitors. The first step toward this tragedy occurred when the group entered the cave with only life jackets and a lifeline. Tethered boats should have been used for the initial traverse to the upstream landing. The lack of proper equipment increased the risk of danger in the cave. The second misstep came when five members of the group decided to leave the cave without the leader's permission, ignoring the risks posed by the rising water. Finally, the most tragic mistake was that not everyone wore their life jackets while in the water. Hector Buesco might have had a chance to survive if he had worn his life preserver. It could have kept him afloat, providing an opportunity to climb above the water in the dark cave. This incident serves as a powerful reminder of the importance of preparation and safety when exploring caves. Even experienced explorers must exercise caution and respect for the cave's natural forces. The Rio Kamui cave system is not a place for those without the necessary skills and equipment. Its beauty and mystery should be approached with care and an understanding of the potential risks. The group that ventured into the cave was driven by a strong desire to explore and document the wonders of the underground world. The thrill of discovery and the chance to witness the stunning formations and hidden chambers fueled their enthusiasm. However, their eagerness to explore also led to a disregard for safety protocols, ultimately resulting in a tragic loss. The explorers were captivated by the charm of the Rio Kamui Cave, drawn by its reputation as one of the world's most magnificent cave systems. They were eager to experience the unique environment, from the towering ceilings and flowing rivers to the diverse ecosystem that thrives in the darkness. The cave offered a rare opportunity to witness nature's artistry and explore a world few had seen. The group's determination to explore the cave was rooted in a sense of adventure and a passion for discovery. The chance to document the cave's beauty and share it with others was a powerful motivator. However, this passion also blinded them to the dangers that lay ahead. In their eagerness to capture the cave's wonders on film, they underestimated the risks and overestimated their ability to navigate the cave's challenges. The tragedy of Hector Buesco serves as a somber reminder of the importance of preparation, respect, and caution when exploring the natural world. The Rio Kamui Cave is a place of incredible beauty and wonder, but it is also a place where nature's forces can quickly turn deadly. Those who venture into its depths must be aware of the risks and take all necessary precautions to ensure their safety. In aftermath of this incident, it is important to learn from the mistakes made and put stricter safety measures in place for future explorations. Having the right equipment, being well prepared, and following safety rules are essential to avoid such tragedies. The Rio Kamui Cave Park is a valuable scientific and ecological resource that gives us important insights into the natural world. By respecting its power and beauty, we can continue to explore and enjoy this amazing underground wonder without putting ourselves or others in danger.
It's July 22nd, 2005 in the Aosta Valley region of Northwest Italy. This lush rural area sits right along the Swiss border. The nearly 15,000 foot Matterhorn towers imposingly over the valley. The region is best known for being one of the world's greatest skiing locations. But today, in the middle of the summer, the Aosta Valley is hosting a smaller number of visitors who still like to hike through the vibrant wilderness amid the lack of snow. Snow remains all year round upon the dramatic slopes of the Matterhorn, however, creating a visually stunning juxtaposition. Painters with their easels and palettes might even be seen perched at different viewpoints practicing their craft. It's likely no one is enjoying the bucolic scene more than the Polizia Locale di Valturnos, the local police department. Warmer temperatures, less crowding with tourists, and fewer calls coming in overall, it's the best time of the year. But on that day, July 22nd, a call comes in. It's no small matter either. Police are told that human remains have been found inside their jurisdiction by mountaineers. Officers are told to come at once. When they ask where the exact location of the body is, they learn that it isn't on the valley floor. It is in fact thousands of feet above sea level, way up the side of the treacherous nearby Matterhorn. No one is quite sure yet just how far up it is, but one thing is clear. This will not be a routine summer day at the office. Investigators are called in. After a strenuous mission to scale the harrowing slopes of the Matterhorn, crew members finally reach the location of the newly discovered corpse. What they find, over 10,000 feet above sea level, both alarms and perplexes them. The remains appear to be those of a skier. In addition to the decomposed remains, investigators find two wooden skis, which appear to be from an expensive brand. They also find a pair of glasses, a wristwatch, and pieces of clothing. In the skier's pocket, they find some loose change. They also find the initials HLM embroidered into the fabric. The unidentified remains and personal effects are carefully collected, then sent directly to the forensic police unit in Turin, roughly 100 kilometers away. There, investigator Marinella Laporta takes stock of what police have found. The remains appear to be those of a man about 5 foot 9 inches tall. He was probably around 30 years old at the time of his death. Laporta also notices the man's expensive skis and embroidered clothing. She guesses that whoever he was, he was probably quite well off. Initially, Laporta estimates that the man must have died sometime during the spring, at the tail end of that year's skiing season. Due to the remote, high-altitude location he was found, his body sat undiscovered for at least a few months before anybody happened to stumble across it. But as investigators continue working to try and uncover the man's identity, they notice something strange, almost unbelievable, about his personal effects. Upon examining the loose change found in the man's pocket, they notice he was carrying a 5 lire coin. That's odd. It's 2005. Italy has not used the lire since 2002, when it officially switched to the euro. The coin is no longer even legal tender. It hasn't been for several years. But there's something much more astonishing about the coin. Experts who examine it find that it was minted sometime between 1946 and 1950. The only purpose a coin like this could serve today would be as a collector's item. But why would someone bring such an item with them in their pocket on a ski trip? Then, investigators began examining the man's watch. Using the unique serial number, they're able to determine that it belongs to a French brand, and that it was sold sometime in February of 1950. Investigator Marinella Laporta and the rest of the Turin Forensics Unit can hardly believe what they're seeing. Could it be that this man has been lying undiscovered, not just for months, but years, decades even, on the side of the Matterhorn? It's March 26, 1954. Today is Henri Le 35th birthday. Henri is an avid skier, so to celebrate, he's left his home city of Paris, where he works in the finance ministry, and traveled over 400 miles to the Swiss-Italian border. 
Henri has brought his skis to this region before. A few years prior, Henri had been skiing near the Matterhorn when he suffered an accident. Thankfully, Henri had walked away shaken, but without serious injury. The story of the accident had alarmed his friends and family, but it still hasn't deterred Henri from his love of skiing. In fact, today, he's back in the very same location he crashed years earlier, the Aosta Valley in Italy. Henri is traveling alone, but that's not unusual. Now 35, the professionally ambitious Frenchman has remained a bachelor, relishing his independence and the freedom to travel when his work life permits. He books a room at a hotel in Val Tournoche for two weeks. It's a beautiful spot, one that in the 21st century would surely be called Instagram-worthy. But Henri doesn't plan on spending much time cooped up in his hotel room. He's eager to put on his expensive new skis and hit the slopes. It will be a full two weeks before anyone from Henri's family hears an update. The update they get is not what they were hoping for. Henri has not been seen or heard from by anyone at the hotel since he went out skiing on his birthday two weeks earlier. They're told a violent storm has swept over the area. This makes any immediate efforts to look for Henri significantly harder, and may have something to do with why Henri is missing in the first place. Desperate, his family's options are frustratingly limited. Henri has gone missing in a rural, geographically challenging area hundreds of miles away. It's 1954. Information can be exchanged at best by expensive, short telephone calls, if at all. Helicopters exist, but are not widespread among rescue crews. Tools like satellite navigation and high-definition video cameras don't yet exist at all. Searching for Henri Lumon in the Aosta Valley really is like searching for a needle in a haystack. The months go by. The months soon turn to years. Henri's brother, Roger, says that eventually his family became, quote, accustomed to the idea that we would never know what happened. By June of 2018, nearly 13 years have passed since Italian police recovered the human remains from the slopes of the Matterhorn. Despite some intriguing clues, they have still not yet been able to make an identification. It's clear that a different approach is needed. The traditional methods so far have turned up nothing. The deceased skier is at risk of remaining nameless forever if police don't act while they have the chance. One suggestion that gets tossed around is that of using social media to try and identify the remains. The idea of posting information about an unsolved case, as well as photos of the evidence recovered, doesn't sit well with some of the investigators. But at this point, new solutions are hard to come by. Plus there's a real chance that someone out there might recognize something. Police have long suspected that the man is not Italian. It would explain why Italian police have had such trouble locating other living friends and family, and vice versa. Another possible reason friends and family have been hard to locate, although hard to believe, is that the man died on the mountain years before he was found, perhaps even many, many years before. Maybe many or even most of the people he knew in life are now gone. All police know for certain is that, no matter what, there will eventually be no one left to identify him if they continue to wait. They decide to go through with it. In June of 2018, Facebook and Twitter posts are made by Italy's Polizia di Stato. In it, police openly share their findings and ask the global community for help. In 2018, Henri Lumon's brother Roger is now 94 years old. Henri has been missing for an astonishing 64 years, longer than the entire lives of many people. One summer day in 2018, Roger receives a phone call from his daughter, Emma Nassim. She sounds anxious, excited. She tells Roger that she's just seen a Facebook post about the remains of a skier which were found in Northwest Italy a little over a decade ago. Emma says that when she heard the story of how and where the remains were found, she was struck by how similar it was to the story she had always heard about her long lost uncle Henri. Roger is even more struck by the similarities. He gets in contact with the Italian authorities, who ask that the 94-year-old submit to a DNA test. 
If Roger's DNA is compared to the DNA of the missing skier, authorities can either rule out Henri Lumon, or they can confirm that Henri Lumon, Roger's missing brother, is in fact the recovered skier, the mystery man who they've been trying to identify all along. On Saturday, July 28th, 2018, 23,439 days after he was last seen, Italian police break the news. DNA tests have confirmed that the remains belong to Roger Lumon's brother, Henri Lumon. Henri had presumably been caught in the late winter storm back in 1954 and died of hypothermia, stranded at an altitude of over 10,000 feet. Both he and his skis remained there undisturbed roughly two-thirds of the way up the Matterhorn while some 150,000 other people climbed the mountain and roughly 300 to 400 new deaths and attempted rescue missions took place all around him. Below him, small black and white television sets with four channels turned into smartphones connected to the internet. The billboard charts moved from featuring Frank Sinatra and Perry Como to featuring the Black Eyed Peas and Fall Out Boy. Above him, a rocket sent people to the moon and back, and the sky became populated with satellites and an international space station. But perhaps most striking of all for Henri would be his younger brother Roger, who he last saw as a spry 30-year-old becoming a very old man, the oldest in the entire family. Finally, at 94, older than most ever get to be, baby brother Roger finds Henri at last lying in wait, hidden in plain sight on one of the most looked at mountains on Earth for over half a century. We hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. Despite a conclusive, bittersweet ending, the story of Henri Lumon remains somewhat mysterious. How was it possible that his remains could go undiscovered for so long on such a popular mountain? The highest peak located anywhere outside of Asia is Aconcagua, a colossal mountain in the Andes of Argentina. This mountain is deceptive because although it might seem relatively straightforward to climb at first glance, it is riddled with hidden dangers. In February of 2023, the darkest potential of those hidden dangers came to reality. In the span of mere days, several people met several different kinds of disaster while scaling the Aconcagua summit. This extraordinary and grim series of events prompted Aconcagua to be thrust into the international news spotlight. This is the story of the recent catastrophes that have struck Aconcagua in Argentina. On Saturday, February 4th, 2023, a 62-year-old from Norway was attempting to scale the summit of Aconcagua. His name was Moe Oystein. Oystein was making his way up towards a section called La Cueva. La Cueva means the cave in Spanish, and it is located just a few thousand feet below the very top, some 19 to 20,000 feet above sea level. The name refers to a large, concave base wall of rock that signals the beginning of the final, steep stretch to the summit. La Cueva is typically a spot where climbers will stop momentarily to rest, rehydrate, and refuel before attempting to push through all the way to the top. This was Moy Oystein's plan, but as he gazed up at the rock wall above him, dragging step by step ever closer toward a much-needed chance to sit down and catch his breath, he would have had little idea what horrible fate awaited him upon arrival. At 22,838 feet, Aconcagua's peak is the highest point above sea level you can reach anywhere in the Americas. At roughly 80% the height of Mount Everest, you'd think that attempting to climb to the top of Aconcagua is a harrowing challenge reserved exclusively for experienced, dedicated climbers. But you'd be wrong. In fact, Aconcagua is widely considered to be the tallest mountain on Earth that can be climbed without pins, axes, or ropes. This is because, unlike so many other peaks that reach four to five miles into the sky, Aconcagua is a non-technical climb. If climbed from the northern side along what is considered the standard route, the path to the summit is really more like a steep hike than a full-on climb. 
This leads many to believe that Aconcagua is similar to Kilimanjaro, a mountain in Africa famous for its accessibility. For globe-trotting mountaineering enthusiasts, Aconcagua is in fact often thought of as the next step after summiting Kilimanjaro. But while a whopping 98% of those who attempt to reach the summit of Kilimanjaro are successful, the percentage of those attempting to reach the summit of Aconcagua who are successful is, let's just say, not so high. Even Mount Everest sees a summit success rate of roughly 66%. But according to contemporary estimates on Aconcagua, only 30 to 40 percent successfully reach the top. There are a few key factors that most who flock to Aconcagua during the climbing season reliably overlook. One very important difference between Aconcagua and other mountains like Kilimanjaro or Everest is that when you climb Everest or Kilimanjaro, you have to have a guide. This generally means you'll also have tents to sleep in, a staff to cook meals, clean water to drink and wash with, and a team to help carry most of the heavy supplies. You'll also, very importantly, have guidance on how to acclimate to the intense elevation changes. Aconcagua, on the other hand, does not require you to have a guide. Legally, you can simply buy a permit to enter Aconcagua Provincial Park and then have at it. It is reported that most people who attempt the summit choose to do so with a guide, even though not legally required to. However, even if you have a guide, there are still other factors that make this mountain harder than it seems. Another major factor when climbing Aconcagua is the weather. The mountain gets really, really cold. We're talking temperatures of negative 30 degrees Celsius being not unusual. Although it isn't glaciated, Aconcagua gets plenty of snow and ice. It can also be quite windy, which doesn't help anything in any way. Lastly, perhaps the biggest separator between Aconcagua and any other supposedly easy mountain is its height. Aconcagua is more than a full kilometer higher than Kilimanjaro. This makes the final stretch of the climb extremely difficult, primarily because of the altitude. Just the final 8,000 feet of the climb alone, about 3 miles up and back, can take 12 hours to complete. This means the extreme altitude can weaken even very fit people to an average speed of a quarter of a mile an hour. Thanks to extreme factors like the ones described, this most recent climbing season has so far been unusually deadly on Aconcagua. As 64-year-old Norwegian Moy Ostein made his way up to La Cueva, he began to exhibit signs, unnoticed at first, of a dangerous medical condition that was quickly developing. His heart began beating unusually quickly, and his head began to ache. Oystein would have also noticed his breathing getting more and more laborious, but may not have thought much of it just yet. After all, he was climbing up the side of a mountain. Once he finally reached the resting point at the foot of La Cueva, the relieved Oystein sat down and tried to catch his breath. And that's when trouble really began. Despite his best attempts, Oystein could not get his breathing back to normal, nor could he seem to get his heart to stop pounding. He began to feel restless, confused, panicky. His head started throbbing harder and harder. Amid the onset of symptoms, many of which can affect thinking, Oystein was probably still able to realize with dread what was happening, both to his body and to his mind. The extreme elevation and rapid ascent were causing him to become hypoxic, a condition more commonly known as altitude sickness. In most cases, altitude sickness is a very unpleasant but non-life-threatening condition, similar to a bad hangover. But in extreme cases, altitude sickness is profoundly dangerous. Sufferers can begin to experience visual hallucinations, lose their ability to walk, and fall into a coma before eventually dying if the symptoms are not hastily reversed. Moy Oystein was unable to overcome the acute altitude sickness with which he was struck. His rapid heart rate eventually began to reverse, slowing to dangerously infrequent beats. He died some 20,000 feet up the side of Aconcagua. This made his death the first registered fatality of the 2022-2023 climbing season, but Oystein would not be the only fatality. 
Literally the next day, a U.S. military veteran named John Michael Magnus climbed past the very spot where Moy Oystein had met his untimely demise. Magnus was participating in an event called the Aconcagua Challenge, a fundraiser for a veterans organization called the Johnny Mac Soldiers Fund. Magnus managed to reach the coveted summit, posing for a photo with an American flag draped around his shoulders. As triumphant as the photo is, however, the image also reveals a very cold-looking John Michael Magnus, with bits of frost scattered across his tightly worn beanie. The photo also shows what appear to be poor weather conditions. Dark gray fog surrounds the flag-draped Magnus as he tries to keep warm. Having made it all the way to the top, Magnus and his teammates may have understandably assumed that it was all downhill from there. But while that was of course technically true, every second spent at high elevation in freezing temperatures counts. Even as they made their way back down the slopes of Aconcagua, Magnus noticed that he was beginning to feel strange. Soon, he was feeling so out of breath and disoriented that he stopped his descent. At around 20,000 feet, Magnus soon succumbed to what the Johnny Mac Soldiers Fund would later describe as, quote, medical complications. It seems likely this would have been hypoxia, but hypothermia certainly isn't out of the question, nor are the two conditions mutually exclusive. Magnus's climbing mates, two other veterans named Keith Brown and Don Fallon, were unable to rescue their fallen comrade. Miles away from a hospital and thousands of feet above any outside help, John Michael Magnus became Aconcagua's second death of the season, just hours after Moy Oystein, and not far from the spot where Oystein died. Any time a climber meets their demise on a mountain, it's a tragedy. But two climbers dying within 24 hours of each other in roughly the same spot was a tragic coincidence that even lethal mountains like Aconcagua don't usually see. Yet, amazingly, more death was already cresting over the horizon. The following Tuesday, February 7th, a 41-year-old mountaineer from the United States named Anthony Simmons was high on the slopes of Aconcagua, and he was having an argument with his guide. The guide, who remains anonymous, was pleading with Simmons, saying the weather conditions were too severe and they should turn back. But Simmons and his climbing partner were both refusing to follow their guide's advice. This is never the situation any guide wants to find themselves in. According to standard protocols, mountaineering guides whose clients refuse to back down and insist on climbing further up must immediately report the situation to local officials and then continue climbing alongside the mutinous clientele. This is what Anthony Simmons' guide did on February 7th, 2023. The trio, Simmons, his friend, and the overruled guide all climbed on, entering dangerous conditions high on the slopes of Aconcagua. Miraculously, the group somehow managed to make it to the summit. But even as Simmons and his friend were celebrating, the guide wasn't. In fact, he was too busy noticing Simmons exhibiting signs of hypoxia. Before long, the guide was helping Simmons stay upright as they hurried their way back down the mountain. Not long after that, Simmons was practically having to be dragged along the ground. Eventually, the group reached a sheltered area where the guide could provide Simmons with supplemental oxygen something he knew Simmons desperately needed. Rescue crews made their way up the side of the mountain, sending even more people into the dangerous weather conditions. Simmons, whose condition had only continued to worsen, was carried down the mountain on a stretcher in the early morning hours of Wednesday, February 8th. He was later pronounced dead at a nearby hospital. In the span of four days, Aconcagua claimed the lives of three different visitors. Thousands of people are estimated to be attempting the summit of Aconcagua in 2023. The fact that so early into the year so much death has already occurred does not bode well. Although it wasn't a fatal accident, another event struck Aconcagua in January of 2023 that could have easily been a fourth death if not for improbable good fortune. A 32-year-old climber from the UK suffered a serious fall while scaling Aconcagua. The horrific result included a fractured skull and a right leg which had to be amputated in order to save his life. 
Beautiful natural marvels like Aconcagua entice visitors from around the world thanks to a stunning combination of beauty, adventure, and ease of novice access. But, as you might imagine, hearing these attributes listed together, that's a very potent combination that can lead to a lot of death and misery, especially if one ignores the stern advice of local guides. We can only hope that no further such tragedies occur on the slopes of Aconcagua, but with the year still young and thousands of prospective visitors, hope is really about the only thing we've got. We hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. Would you ever consider climbing a mountain like Aconcagua? And if so, how would you ensure that you'd avoid disasters like the ones described here today? Please, share your thoughts with us in the comments section below. Thank you so much for watching, and please be sure to like the video and subscribe for more content like this in the near future. That's all for now. We'll see you next time.